Amen. Amen. Thanks, Pope. Alrighty, I have a question for you guys. How many of you like animals? Animals. By a show of, by a show of hands. Okay, half of you are like, I hate animals. Um, how many of you who love animals had pets growing up? Okay, I want to hear like what type of pet it was, what the name of this pet was. Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'll, I'll, I'll point to you. Come on, come on now. A Rottweiler named Dixon. Pretty good. Okay. Anybody else? Riley. A cat named Ninja. Pretty good. Dog named Cedric. I like dogs that have like normal human names, right? You're like, this is my dog, Bill. You're like, oh, okay. What else? What other? What other? Did anybody have a, a pet growing up that wasn't a dog or a cat? Like something kind of out there. A, a guinea pig named Mr. Chips? Okay, all right. In Ecuador, we eat guinea pig. Oops. It, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I started that way. Anybody else? Any, like, weird pets like that? I moved to Atascadero, and my neighbors have goats, and my other neighbors have a horse. So I'm still kind of blown away by that, but... Pigs? Do they have names? Sass and Smalls. Do you ever say, you're killing me, Smalls? You ever say that to them? What else? Two more. One. Back to... A goat named Merlin. Okay. One more. Its name was Broken Wing or? Oh, it had a broken wing. Did it have a name? Simon. I like that. I thought it was like one of those, you know, like runs with horses, the one with the broken wing type of thing. Um, we had a lot of pets growing up. Uh, I, I grew up in Ecuador and my parents... We had four kids, and that wasn't enough, so we had lots of pets, always. I had a dog named Sergeant, and he was a German shepherd. Um, he committed suicide, whoops, out of the de- back of my dad's truck. Uh, we think he saw a squirrel or something, like jumped out, <sighs> done. Uh, we had Seamus, he was a golden retriever, his name was Seamus, oh, I already said that. Uh, my mom's Irish, uh, he was awesome, he lived 13 long years, love Seamus, I'd like to believe that he's still alive somewhere, like running around in a field in Ecuador, because I left, and then my parents put him down, and I was super sad. Uh, we had two parrots, and their names were Dumb and Dumber, and I hated those things. I hated the parrots, because they would wake me up every morning at like 6.30 a.m. just squawking. Um, I had a pet turtle, don't remember his name. Uh, I had a pet fish. It was like one of those black ones with the long, like, dangly, you know what I'm talking about? You know those fish? Beta fish? Sure, beta fish. Um, the first time I washed its bowl, I washed it with soap. Apparently not supposed to do that. The next morning, uh, beta was like, on its side. Uh, but my favorite pet that I had growing up was a monkey. I had a pet monkey. Uh, my mom was out of town, of course, traveling, and my dad got a call from one of his buddies. And my dad picks up the phone, and he's like, a monkey, what? And all of us kids are like, huh, what? Dad? So we come on over to my dad on the phone, and he's like, um, I mean, can I like, have a couple days to think about it? And the, his buddy was like, no, I got this monkey. I have it now. My wife said, no, your wife's out of town. Like, can you take it? So my dad is like, hey, kids, you guys want a monkey? And we're like, nah. Oh, obviously, we're like, yes, we want a monkey. Like, heck yeah, bring this thing over. So my dad brings it over. It's in like a, one of those dog cages, you know what I mean? And it's this tiny little pocket marmoset monkey, tiny little thing. There's like a couple branches and like a leaf in there to recreate what he's used to, right, in the jungle. Um, and then uh, this monkey, just wild monkey. That night, we go to pick up my mom at the airport. My dad sits all four of us kids down. He's like, listen closely, okay? When we pick up mom from the airport, we're not going to tell her first thing that we got a monkey, okay? I'm going to break it to her smoothly. I got some of her favorite flowers at home. Like, we're going to, like, play this cool. And we're like, yeah, yeah, for sure, Dad. We got you. We got you. Um, we show up in the airport. My mom rolls out, right? She's got a rolly suitcase. And she's, she's like, hey, kids. We're like, we got a monkey! <laughs> like, first thing. And they're like, oh. My dad's like, I'm going to kill you guys. Um, But actually, my mom killed my dad. But she ended up loving this monkey. And this monkey was wild, like so crazy when we first got it. We had to put a like big old construction glove on and we would just like, they're like, you grab it. You know, we would pull straws, shortest straw would go in there and just grab it. And this thing would be like, 
we're like freaking out. And we're like, oh, that was sweet, all right. And eventually, like week after week after week, months went by, and my mom sat with this thing, like every single day just sat and tamed it and trained this monkey. And this, my mom literally became this monkey's mom. And my, the monkey, like whenever it was scared, anything would always run to my mom. And because it loved my mom. And it would curl up on her neck, underneath her hair when it was scared. And it was this tiny little thing. I have a picture of not my monkey, but that's what it looked like. It was a pocket marmoset monkey. Tiny little thing. That's a baby. They did, it grew up to be like a small squirrel. Like, probably like that big. I had a little white mustache and a really long tail. And we as kids, because we were brilliant, we named it Chime which in one of the uh, local dialects there means monkey. We were super creative children. Uh, But my favorite story of all time of this monkey. So it would curl up in my mom's neck, like hide in her hair. Uh, One day my dad was having a team meeting. So my parents were missionaries down there. He was having a team meeting and uh, had a bunch of people over. And one of the guys on our team, his name was Aaron Passmore, big old dude, played rugby, benched like 400 pounds. This dude was massive, okay? Uh, my mom's not around, so the monkey gets scared, and it runs up to Aaron, thinks it's my mom or something, I don't know, and uh, <laughs> like sits down on my Aaron's shoulder, kind of nuzzles his neck, and Aaron's like, hmm, whatever. And uh, meeting goes on, you know, the monkey's there just chilling. All of a sudden, uh, this thing kind of like makes its way down Aaron's shirt a little bit, and it's like sitting in there, and Aaron's like, oh, he's just trying to get warm or something, and you know, my dad keeps talking, and all of a sudden, Aaron's sitting there, and he jumps up in the middle of my dad's meeting, and he's like, oh! And we were like, what? And to this day, not really sure what Chi Man was trying to do, but uh, he bit Aaron's nipple, so it's kind of funny. Hey, if you have your Bibles with you, open them up to John 15. John 15 is where we're going tonight. This passage for me, uh, John 15, is one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible. And growing up, uh, my dad always used this passage in those training meetings when he was discipling guys. Uh, Whenever I had a training thing, you know, I was involved in youth group and I was involved in leadership and I felt like this passage kept coming up again and again and again in my life. And when Brandon talked to me about you guys going through the I Am series, you know, I almost was like that giddy little kid who jumped up and was like, can I take the I Am the True Vine, please? Like, that's, that's my favorite. That's my absolute favorite. All throughout college, um, I had to write research papers for different Bible classes that I took, and John 13, 14, and 15 kept coming up. It was like this thing that just kept coming, kept coming, kept coming. So I'm just going to read it, 15, 1 through 17. I'm going to read the whole thing, and then we're going to go from there. If you don't have a Bible, we have it up on the screens if you want to follow along. It goes like this, 15.1. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. And if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I didn't command you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Pray with me. God, I thank you for tonight. Thank you that we can just hang out here and gather together and God, we can sing songs to you and we can learn new songs and we can glorify you and worship you and open up your word. God, I thank you that you gave us your word. 
that you, the God of the universe, loved us enough to write us a book, to write us a love story. God, I thank you that we can open it up and read it and engage in it and learn from it tonight. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 15.1 says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. When you're looking at that, when you're reading it, the first word that pops up to me is true. Why does he say, I am the true vine? Why didn't he just say, I am the vine? And as I looked into this, as I dove into it, as I studied it in college, the reason he says true vine is because he's referring to Israel. So he's walking, he's talking with his disciples here, and when he started talking about the vine and the vineyard and fruit, their minds would have immediately gone to Israel. There's a couple sections in the Old Testament in Psalm 80, Ezekiel 15, and Isaiah 5, just to mention a couple of them, where Israel is, is proclaimed as the vine. And that God the Father is said to be the vine dresser or the guy who takes care of the vine. And Israel in the Old Testament is a lot of the times referred to as the vine who is producing bad or sour grapes. And there's a couple of these passages that are brutal. There's a couple of these passages that lay out this vine and how useless it is and how it's going to be chopped up and how it's producing nothing but bad crop. And if you can imagine, there's lots of vineyards around here. If you can imagine the amount that goes into a vineyard for a vine dresser or an owner of a vineyard to go out to have his crop to wait an entire year for that fruit to come and then to only realize that this, the, the grapes are sour, that it produced a bad fruit, and that this vine, this vineyard wasn't doing what it was designed to do. Right now in junior high, we're talking through um, Israel and the Israelites in an exodus, and we're going through a series called Stupid Israelites. And the reason I call this stupid Israelites is because a lot of the times growing up, I, I looked at the Israelites or I looked at the Old Testament and I'm like, man, how could they make this many mistakes? How could the people of Israel, God's chosen people, mess up again and again and again and again? And in junior high, we're looking about, at our own lives and how we can kind of relate to that and relate to Israel. But Jesus referring back to Israel here, they, they were exactly that sometimes. They, they were the stupid Israelites because they didn't get it. And God chose them. He said, you were my chosen people to represent me to the rest of the world. And he takes the Jewish people, he takes the, the, the Israelites, and he says, you will be my representatives. That when people look at you, they will see me. That when you go into the world, when you interact with other people, people will look at you as Israel and see me. But here, Jesus is proclaiming they messed up. They, they didn't quite get it. So when he's saying, I am the true vine, he's saying, I am the true Israel. I am the true representation of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 is that we can see God in the face of Jesus. That we behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Last week, you guys looked at John 14, 6, right? And Josue was telling you guys that Jesus declared, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. That nobody gets to the Father through me. Again, Jesus is proclaiming his own deity here. He's saying, I am the representative of God. People look at me and they see God. That's what Israel was designed to do. And that's ultimately what Jesus fulfilled here. This is yet another instance where, where we can see God, we can see the glory of God proclaimed in him. And he goes on to say that if we abide in him, we will bear much fruit. Right, so the people of Israel were supposed to represent God. Jesus does represent God. He has the authority to say that if you abide in me, right? As I was reading that, I hope you picked up on the fact that I said abide again and again and again and again and again. Actually, in this passage, in the first 17 verses, John says abide 11 times. I think he meant to say that, right? Abide, abide, abide. You see it over and over again. And as, as the representative of God, Jesus has the authority to proclaim that if you abide in me, I will abide in you and you will bear much fruit. You won't be like the people of Israel who, who grew this sour fruit, who didn't represent God well, but you will bear a fruit that is actually worth something. Right? A lot of times when you think of fruit, at least when I think of fruit in my own life, I think of the fruit of the Spirit and I think of these things that I need to do that I need to bear this fruit, I need to like be more patient, I need to be more kind. But if you think about a fruit tree, a fruit tree doesn't bear fruit for itself, does it? 
An apple tree doesn't bear a bunch of apples and then drop them all, like soak them into the ground and use them to grow more apples. No, an apple tree grows apples so that other people can enjoy apples. An orange tree grows oranges so that someone can come along, pick those oranges, and people can enjoy them. Right? We are designed to abide in the Father. He will abide in us, and then we will bear this fruit for the benefit of those around us. That Jesus was the representative of God, and then he declares that we are to abide in him, and then that he will abide in us, and then we will grow much fruit. How do we do this? How do we abide? What does it mean to abide? If you back up in John 14, Right, right after Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, he declares something in John 14, 15. And in the first time in this section in John, or John or Jesus talks about our, our love for him. He's declared his own love for us in John 13 by washing the disciples' feet. He gives us a new commandment that we are to love one another as he loved us. And then for the first time here in John 14, 15, he talks about us loving him. And in 14.15, he says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. Over the next, like, chapter and a half, he goes on to say that five more times. He mixes up the words a little bit, but he ultimately says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. And in this section, I love this section because it's like, abide, abide, abide. If you love me, obey my commandments. Abide. If you love me, obey my commandments. Abide. And you're like, huh, I wonder what he's trying to say here. Pretty obvious what he's trying to say here, right? He says, if you abide in me, I will abide in you and you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. What does that mean, apart from you, you can do nothing? I can do a lot of things apart from you, God. There are a lot of people out there doing a lot of things apart from you. But in scripture, he's saying you can do nothing of value without me. You will do nothing of eternal value, do nothing that matters. You will bear no fruit that matters or impact the people around you apart from God. And abiding in his love means obeying him. What does that obedience look like? It looks like opening up God's word. It looks like reading this story from Genesis to Revelation. It looks like spending daily time in this so that we can know what his commandments are. How can we obey his commandments if we don't know what they are? Are we spending time in God's word? God's word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. This is a God-breathed book. And if you don't take anything else away from tonight, take away the fact that this book is important and you should read it. If you don't have a Bible, ask somebody here, we can get you one. This book has life within its chapters, within its words. You may not feel it instantly. You may not read it tonight, wake up tomorrow and feel new, but over a stretched period of time, this book will radically impact your life. If you love me, you will obey my commands. That's what it means to abide. To abide in him means to continue in a daily personal relationship with Jesus, a daily relationship with Jesus that's characterized by trust. Do we trust him? That's characterized by prayer. Do we spend time talking with him? By obedience, if we love him, obey his commands, and by joy. When I was about four years old, um, I don't remember this at all, but I was talking to my parents last week, um, trying to get a story about my older siblings about VBS, and they ended up telling me a story about me in VBS. Um, and... It's a pretty good story, so I thought I'd share it with you guys tonight. And it has a lot to do with obedience. Uh, Apparently, I was not the most obedient child. uh, And when I was four, my dad was a pastor of a church, and my mom helped out at the church with different, like, uh, kids' events or VBS or things like that. And apparently, there was a group of four- to six-year-olds. And in this group, uh, me and my friend Casey, we were, like, best friends. We did everything together. Uh, Apparently, we were, like, the most disobedient ones in this group. Um, and so the, the leader of this group said like week after week, she was like, I cannot handle these two boys. Finally, she goes to my dad who's preaching on a, on a Sunday morning. She's like, your son is the biggest disruption in this class. Shocking. I know. Cause I'm such an angel today. But, uh, <laughs> so my dad looks at my mom and he goes, Hey, is there any way that you could go to this class? Like I'm speaking, I can't do that, but can you go and maybe like you can put some, you know, control on this kid. 
And so my mom comes, and apparently uh, I disobeyed my mom as well. So my mom reports back to my dad. The next week, my dad sits me down. He says, look, son, your mom's going to come today. If you disobey her again, the first time you disobey her, you're going to my office, and I'll deal with you afterward. Jeez, okay, dad. I won't, I won't, I won't. I swear I won't. Apparently, uh, within the first five minutes, my mom said, I disobeyed my mom, and my mom said, all right, I'm not dealing with you. You go into dad's office. So I walked up to dad's office, sat down in dad's office chair, and spent the rest of the Sunday in my dad's office chair. Uh, my dad comes in with my mom, and he said the second uh, I, they both walked into the room, I was like, <sighs> my, like you said, my lip just started quivering. I just started tears flowing, and, I, and uh, I looked at my dad, and he said before he could even get a word out, I just said, dad, I'm so sorry. I forgot to remember to obey, and that's what I said to my dad. I forgot to remember to obey. Apparently, that was the best excuse I could come up with. My mom said she died laughing, and my dad hit her and said, get out of here, you know, because she wasn't helping out at all. But that was my excuse to her. I forgot to remember to obey. But as I was thinking about that story, I was like, how often do I tell God that? How often does God say to me five times within the same chapter, if you love me, you will obey my commands? I put a pretty safe bet on the fact that if I ask the majority of you in this room, do you love God? Do you love God? But a solid majority of you would say yes. I'm here tonight because I love God. I sing worship songs because I love God. And yet Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. He goes as far as to define himself as love. He says, this is love for the Father in 1 John, that you obey my commands. He defines the word love as obedience. Do we obey his commands? And yet, I think there's a flip side to that. I think some of us are stuck in that obedience. Right? For me, growing up in a Christian family, growing up, going to church, growing up, you know, Christian school, there was this there were, there were people, and I got stuck in this where it was just like obedience, 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 obedience. It was all about obedience, right? It was like, I wake up, I read my Bible, check. I spend five minutes in prayer, check. I serve. I come to two, uh, Tuesday nights every single Tuesday. I'm in student impact on Sundays. I obey, and it becomes this legalistic, like, obey, 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 obey. But when we look at this, it's not just about obedience, it's not just about a list that we have to check through where we're like, okay, I got that. Just like my parents didn't simply put some rules on me so that I would follow them, grow up to be a good child, and then produce more children. No, it was so much more than this like robotic transaction between like, okay, you read this list of rules, do those rules, grow up, be a good Christian, continue to do that. No, it's so much more than that. And I think I had a lot of friends that got burnt out on that. Or a lot of the times, if we're honest, what's the one word that's like associated with Christians the most often? Somebody say it out loud. Hypocrite. The fact that somebody just said that means something, right? Because Christianity has to be more than just a list of rules. Because if it is a list of rules, we all suck at that. The fact that the word hypocrite is out there is because there's a misunderstanding of what Christianity truly is, and it has to be so much more than this obedience, obedience, obedience. You forget that love part. If you love me, you will obey my commands. My parents gave me a list of rules to follow. They desired that I obey them because they loved me, because they had relationship with me, because they spent time with me. They understood me. I grew to trust them. They grew to trust me. There's a part in this verse that says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Remain in my love. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Jesus is talking a lot more than just a transaction of obedience here. Jesus 
who earlier in John, in John 1, is declared as the one who was there at the beginning of time, who spoke into existence into this world, who was the one who declared that the ocean should rise up, that the land should be there, that the sun should be where it's at. This same Jesus is looking at us and calling us friends. What? This same Jesus, this same God who always has been, who always will be, who is the very essence of everything living, looks at his disciples and calls them friends. You were my friends if you do what I command you, if you abide in my love. Jesus is all about relationship. And even when we look at the Israelites in the Old Testament who screwed up again and again and again and again and again, he was all about relationship with them. God always has been, God always will be about relationship with you, relationship with me. My dad always said two things that I'll always remember. First one was, he said, there's two things that last forever. One of them is God's word. One of them is people. God's word and people. And I would always look at him and I was like, what, is, what does that mean? What does that mean that there are only two things that last forever, God's word and people? And as I've grown up, as I've processed that a little more, you think about it, God's word is eternal and people are eternal. I know we'll you don't like to think about it and I don't like to think about it because I'm still young, but the reality is that all of us in this room one day, we are gonna die, right? That may not be like super kosher to say on stage or to talk about, you know, as high schoolers, as, as a 22-year-old, a lot of times I'm like, I don't really like to think about the fact that I'm gonna die. I'm, I'm invincible. I go skydiving. I bungee jump. You know, I, I, I don't get attacked by sharks when I surf. I, I don't, like, the death is not a reality. You know, and as much as I know that one day I'll die, I operate like I'm invincible. And yet, Scripture tells us that at, at some point, at one point that we will all face God. At one point we will stand before him, and this was the other thing my dad always said. He said, at one point when we stand before him, God will ask us two questions. He's going to look at us and he's say, do you know my son? And what did you do with what I gave you? Do you know my son? Not do you know about my son? Not if I gave you a 10 question quiz right now about Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, could you pass it? But do you know my son? Have you experienced my son? That word know, that word know is one of my favorite words in the Bible. If you back up to the story of Abraham and Isaac, uh, Abraham is, is told that he needs to sacrifice his son Isaac. A lot of you are familiar with this story, but he takes his, his son Isaac up the mountain and he's about to kill him. He's about to sacrifice him because he's being obedient to God. And right when he's got the knife up, God says, stop, stop. Look, caught in, in the bush is a ram take the ram, sacrifice that and said, save your son. And then God looks at Abraham in Genesis twenty two twelve, 12, and he says, now I know that your faith is genuine. Now I know that you are obedient, even to the point of giving up the one thing that you love most in this life, which is your son. Now I know. When I first read that verse, it kind of threw me for a loop a little bit. I was like, what do you mean now I know? Was God like sitting on the edge of his seat like I do in movies and is like, what's Abraham going to do? Oh, okay, he was willing to kill him. Whew. Abraham, now I know, man. Now I know you're my guy. Now I know that you're the one. No, of course not. Right? If you know about God, God is all-knowing. God is sovereign. God always has been. He always will be. There's nothing that surprises God. So as you dig a little deeper into that, that word know in the Hebrew is yada. Yada. And that word know is the same one. I'm going to ask for a little bit of maturity here. In, in Genesis 4 1, in like other uh, translations like New King James, actually the ESV does it as well. It says, Adam knew his wife and they bore a son, Cain. Adam knew his wife and they bore a son. And that same word shows up again, yada. Do you know? God? Have you experienced God in the same way that God experienced Abraham's faithfulness? It's an intimate knowledge of. 
It's an experience of. In Spanish, there are two words for know. There's saber and there's conocer. Saber is to, to head knowledge something. Saber is to know that five plus five equals 10, I think. Conocer is to experience something. You would ask something, someone if they have conocer America, if they've conocer California, if they have experienced it, if they've been there, right? The difference between saber, head knowledge, and conocer is to head know something or to experience something, to heart know something. Because you've been there, you've experienced it. That's the same word that he uses. Yada, to know Conocer, and that's the question that I believe God will ask every single one of you. Do you yada my son? Have you experienced my son? Do you know him? Do you abide in him? Do you abide in his love? Have you obeyed his commandments, not just as a list, but out of love? There's this idea of being actively still before God. And it's one of my favorite images when reading John 15 is that of, uh, of F-16, of a jet plane. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a jet pilot more than anything, but it was just because I'd seen Top Gun more than one time. You know, I'd seen, like 15 times. I loved that movie. But there's this idea of, of being a jet pilot, of being an Air Force pilot, that they, they can go all over, they can do whatever they want, they're the fastest in the sky. But here's the thing about a, a jet plane, about an F-16, is it runs out of fuel. And at one point, it needs to refuel. And so they came up with this other plane that it was just this kind of slow, big bomber that would come, and it was full of fuel, and it would lower down this pipe. And that the F-16 would have to come just match the speed, the altitude, everything of this, this fuel plane. They would lower down this pipe, and the F-16 could refuel in midair. It could get filled up, and then it could go out again. And it could do what it was designed to do, to be fast, to be nimble, to shoot other planes down. I think that, that image of that jet plane matching the other plane in active stillness, right? They're still both moving. They're still both going. They're still both going at incredible speeds. And yet it matches the altitude, the speed, the height, everything of this other plane in active stillness. And I think that helped me understand what it means to abide. Eleven times he says, abide in me and I will abide in you. Abide in my love. Abide, abide, abide. What does it mean for you, for me, to abide in him this week? Jesus declares, I am the true vine. I am representative of God. I am God. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Are we abiding in him? Do we know him? Have we experienced him this week? Do we know where we stand with God? I'm going to ask you to do something a little weird. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. One of my favorite things to do with this passage is something called Lectio Divina. And it simply means this. It simply means to hear the words and to soak them in. I'm going to read this passage again just like I did in the beginning. I'm going to read it a little slower. I want you just to ask yourself that question, do I know God? Am I abiding in him? Have I experienced him? I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may, be, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. 